Good day, everyone. Uh, I'm, of course, John Korstein, Director Emeritus of the USS Monitor Center here at the Mariner's Museum and Park. And today, I'm going to talk about one of the most innovative and practical scientific minds that served for the Confederacy, John Mercer Brook. I've already been asked a question, what's the hat is he wearing? And this is called an ottoman. It's a smoking hat. Uh, you know, when you're the influence of the Middle Eastern dress and so forth after the Crimean War, after the Anglo occupation of, or not occupation, but protectorate over Egypt, that became very stylish. He should be in a smoking jacket and he should have slippers uh, that kind of curl up, uh, but you know, well, we don't get the whole image. But this man, is perhaps uh, one of the most brilliant minds in America uh, as he works his way uh, through the U.S. Navy and through the Confederate Navy. I have to tell you, uh, he's going to be born at Fort Brook uh, um, in near Tampa Bay, Florida, um, in 18, uh, December 1825. His father uh, was just so happened to be Brigadier General George Mercer Brooke. And, and, and so he established Fort Brooke, and so that is the name for him. And he was innovative in how he laid out his post because most of the time they cut down all the trees. Instead, he kept all the live oaks so it would provide shade for his men. Well, um, his father will become a brevet major general. In 1846, he's in command of the Western Division of the U.S. Army, stationed at New Orleans. It is his father who's going to make sure that both Zachary Taylor and Winfield Scott all are receiving the men and supplies they need to persecute the war during uh, the Mexican conflict. So actually, and he's in charge of everything east of the Mississippi, so he's considered one of the more outstanding leaders of the first half of the U.S. Army's history in the 19th century. But you know, Brooke is a true FFV, or as we like to say, First Families of Virginia. Now, he was related to Major General Dabney Hurden Murray, um, and who, the Brooks' great great grandfather, was a member of the Knights of the Golden Horseshoe Expedition sent out by Alexander Spotswood to explore into the Shenandoah Valley. Wow, I gotta tell you, um, his grandfather was a hero of the Revolutionary War. He's a member of the Virginia General Assembly and was governor of Virginia uh, from 1794 to 1796. Well, Brooke comes with a great pedigree. And, and John Mercer Brooke liked to use, you know, there are some people in the South that always use their middle names. There's a reason because those middle names are connected to some family. So this, this gives John Mercer Brook like a, an entry to almost anywhere. In fact, the young John Mercer Brook is going to be appointed by Virginia as a midshipman in 1841. And he did graduate um, in one of the first classes, top of the class, from the United States Naval Academy in 1847. Uh, remember uh, that Franklin Buchanan will create the uh, U.S. Naval Academy. Uh, he's the first superintendent. And he will actually, so all of a sudden, Brooke gets to know some of the leading people in the U.S. Navy. Uh, his pedigree is tremendous. So. When he gets out of the academy, he then, this is the earliest picture I could find. I'm sure there are earlier ones, this is 1881, um, but the Naval Academy took over the site of Fort Stevens in Annapolis. 
So uh, I have to tell you, right away, he gets assigned to work with this man. And this is, of course, um, Matthew Fontaine Mari. And Mari had booked a beginning to work on charting the stars, very similar to what John Lomer Worden did while he was assigned to the Naval um, Observatory. And uh, so as a result of this, he will chart stars, but he was soon assigned to a special project that Maury was working on. And it was sounding the deep sea floor. Now, believe it or not, most oceanographers, most scientists all believe that the sea floor was flat, right? And Maury deduced, well, that can't be possible. And Brook did some studies, says, no, that can't be. And so they're actually, I have to tell you, um, the peaks and valleys within the oceans, right, are caused by rivers that flow deeper down. And so they form, just like rivers do uh, on terra firma, they are going to do under the water. So that's an important thing to chart. How deep is that? And how can we make soundings? And the desire was to create soundings that went down to over 10,000 feet. And to make these soundings, you also had to discover what was the conditions of the soil uh, at, the, uh, um, at the bottom of the, of the seabed. Well, working out of uh, the Naval Observatory, we know that uh, Brooke will work closely with Mari, and they uh, start to test various things. And so the big thing that John Mercer Brooke is going to invent is this item. Now, this may not look like a whole lot, but this is a fathometer. In fact, Brooke invented the first fathometer, and not only a fathometer, but also something that could collect, collect soil samples from the ocean floor. So basically, it's a cannonball with a big tube. The tube is coated so that when you pick up soil samples, uh, there's a closure right inside the cannonball. Cannonball helps you go down, right? And so this is a uh, created thing. Back when they first used it, they found these creatures at deep depths, you know, these shells. And they said, well, how can they be there? Because those shells, they went to an expert, they said, those shells have to be at 100 feet below the water. So those dead crustaceans all drop farther down. So they was proving their concept of currents. Now, remember, Mari's famous for what? Charting currents, but there are also currents that are different beneath uh, the uh, um, on the ocean floor. Uh, so, Mari, with this, right, and this is actually called a deep sounding collection device. That that's how it's called when it first comes out, but it's a fathometer. And so, Mari sent out ships at 200 mile intervals, Newfoundland to Ireland and with Brooke, and they are testing the various depths. And they start to understand, because they have several square miles, each 200 miles, where they're testing what's underneath. They find that there are peaks and valleys on the ocean floor that they actually could withstand laying a transatlantic paper. Well, Mari and Book published a paper saying, hey, look what we can do. And so Cyrus Fields and Samuel Morse go to them and say, golly, can we really have it safely done? Mari said, well, we just have to go deep enough so that no anchor or fishing trawler nets can disturb the um, uh, 
the cable. And so they build uh, the uh, first uh, cable, uh, transatlantic cable, in 1859. Uh, and basically, there is a me the first message it goes from um, President Franklin Buchanan to Queen Victoria and that. So it really worked because they knew how to lay it in the canyons that existed on the seabed. The, you know, um, the, I read that report, but I couldn't read it all. It is a little technical for me. Um, but nevertheless, um, Brooke uh, is now a famous scientist, and he will actually be sent on the North Pacific Exploring and Surveying Expedition, also known as the Rogers Ringgold Expedition. Now, it, it, it's sad that Ringgold, who was in charge, caught malaria. He goes to Hong Kong, and actually, he starts to act very insane. Like, no ship can report because. Oh, look, it's got a missing paint right over there. Um, in fact, Matthew Galbraith Perry has to go to Hong Kong, have a court of inquiry, and judges um, wrangled to be insane. So that's not very fun to start an expedition, but nevertheless, um, <laughs> Brooke is uh, assigned to the Vincennes. Uh, he traveled up in the Western Pacific uh, coast all the way up to the Bering Sea charting, mapping, and understanding not only coastlines, not only upper level currents, but also currents deep below the water surface. And on this expedition, uh, he will be chief astronomer of the expedition, serving on this ship. Now, I have to say that uh, uh, Brooke will then, um, uh, this is a Boston class ship, and of course, um, the voyage that he did um, actually gave him all these tremendous insights um, into, um, you know, mapping, charting, and so forth. Now, after the uh, North Pacific Expedition. He goes back to the Naval Observatory with a commander, John Rogers, another luminary from the war, and they create all of the charts and maps documenting the expedition. What did they find? And so, however, they don't want him in writing reports. In 1858, they uh, are going to send him on the schooner USS Fenimore Cooper uh, to actually chart the shipping lanes between San Francisco and China. How can we get there faster? What is the best way to uh, move using the currents? He also did the topography of the North Pacific Seafloor and also he surveyed the coast of Japan. Now, the Fenimore Cooper um, encountered a very fierce storm in Kangawaga Bay, Yokohama, Japan, on 23 August 1859. The ship ran aground. It was totally wrecked. However, Brooke organized the saving of all the men, all the instruments, all the charts, and all the other valuable research that Brooke had um, the game. Well, this is a, a pretty major accomplishment. His next duty was to go with the ship called the Parent Han Ben Maru, which is Japanese for unyielding. Um, uh, he, he's going to be the technical advisor on the ship. Now, the um, Han Ben Maru is a vessel that was built in the Netherlands starting in 1853 because, you know, we hadn't had that treaty with Japan yet. We, so they only trusted the Dutch uh, for some odd reason. And uh, uh, so the bottom line was, was that they built this steam screw sloop. This is the first steam screw sailing sloop 
that's going to be in the Japanese Navy. Just remember, when all those Westerners start coming knocking on their door, they say, we've got to get, we have, we have to gain this knowledge. And so they set up a naval school in Nagasaki, and that's where the uh, Kanemaru would be stationed. However, Brooke is there. He is actually a highly touted scientist. So they were going down to the Naval School, becomes a technical advisor, and then the Japanese organized their first delegation to go to the United States. And so Brooke will be assigned uh, to be on the ship, not commander of the ship. However, he's teaching the Japanese petty officers, enlisted men, officers, about no Japanese ship had crossed the Pacific since I think it's 1614. And they went to Mexico, came back, never to go back again. Uh, so uh, that's a little known story. Uh, but the, the big thing is, is Brooke now is considered not only a scientist, not only a brilliant sailor, but also a brilliant teacher, and also um, you know, the great scientist of the ocean. And so uh, I have to say that they leave Japan February 1860 and will then arrive in uh, uh, San Francisco in early March 1861. What's happening then? Well, let me tell you, Brooke, while he's gone, he receives the gold medal of science from the Berlin Academy in 1858, didn't know that. And then also, he had invented a boat hook for the U.S. Navy. The boat hook they used into the mid 20th century. They used the fathometer invented by Brooke until the early 20th century. So Brooke has this lasting impact. So this boat hook is so great that Congress awards Mari, or not Mari, Brooke, a award of $5,000 in gold. He goes to DC and picks it up in mid-March. Of course, as we know, Virginia leaves the Union on April 17, 1861. And Brooke, being, as he could consider himself, a true Virginian, that he goes south. What does he do with those $5,000? He buys Confederate bonds. Okay, so, you know, that's, he may be a scientist, but not very good with other things, you know. What can I say? So, uh, Brooke uh, is, is so prominent that... Uh, uh, he uh, uh, will, as soon as the Virginia Navy is organized, he will be um, named lieutenant in the Virginia Navy and assigned to be the chief naval aide to Robert E. Lee. This is when Virginia hadn't joined the Confederacy yet. So as a result of that, um, he will actually begin designing fortifications along with his friend Kate the Roger Jones along the James River. In fact, John Mercer Brook helps design the fort where that is built over top of the original James City Fort, you know, that where they are doing all the archaeology now. So, but that's a waste of his talents. And, and so when uh, the Virginia joins the Confederacy, uh, he will actually be assigned to the staff of Secretary of the Navy for the Confederacy, Stephen Russell Mallory. Now, Mallory was a great selection for this job because he had been, prior to the war, uh, spent uh, two terms as the head of the Committee of Naval Affairs. So he knows all about what the te technological changes that are happening throughout the world. 
But more importantly, he knows about John Milton's book. So Brooke gets assigned to Mallory, and uh, so that is going to really make a huge difference in many ways. Uh, he'll be appointed lieutenant in the Confederate Navy on uh, May 2nd, 1861. And he will work on several special projects at the outset of his work for Mallory. Project number one, oh my God, so that's the Karen Maru. Uh, there he is, after he's sent, sent that 5,000 gold to the Confederate bond. Um, this is the first thing he does for the Confederate Navy. He designs the uniform coat button. Yeah. Can you imagine to the brilliant mind uh, into helping design the uniforms for the Confederate Navy? Uh, so, uh, this, this, that's a little quote of history, but the real thing he does is that he is going to be involved uh, with the conversion the conversion of the USS Merrimack into the powerful ironclad ram Virginia. Now Mallory, at the very beginning of the war, says he needs to build ships that are steam powered, that are covered with iron, that have rifle guns, and have rams. Well, how to do that in the industrial poor confederacy becomes the big question. And that question is going to be answered by whom? John Mercer Brook. So they actually set up a team of people uh, known as, um, well, William Price Williamson, chief engineer of the Confederate Navy, and uh, chief naval constructor, John Luke Porter. Now, Brook and Porter, why well, can't get along? You know, because you know, Brook's a scientist, Porter is a shipwright, in essence, and uh, who becomes an able constructor. So, um, you know, they have a lot of disagreements. But what Brooke first does is um, he first uh, decides to have, see the elongated ends of the um, Merrimack conversion into the Virginia. He uh, long ends are meant to give the ship a greater stability. You see where the casemate is? John Luke Porter goes to Richmond for these meetings with a design, which we have in the museum, of a floating battery. Uh, so they have no ends to it. It's straight armor. So what Brooke does is says, well, we elongate the ends making them just barely submerged, that is going to enable us to actually be stabilized. Then we have to think about the casemate. The casemate is going to be one of the most critical items um, that uh, we have involved in this project because John Mercer Brook in these meetings says, well, uh, we have to have a slope on our casemates of 36 degrees. Why is that? Because it's better to deflect shot. And so, actually, Brooke uses a study written by Major John Gross Bernard called Elements of Seacoast Fortification. The snoozer, but I'll tell you, it is really great because it's for coast artillery that you've got to have these sloped sides, no matter if it's brick, no matter if it's concrete, no matter if it's earth. So Brooke takes that concept and says, well, the same thing applies. And so he wants to create steel, but he can't, right? And better is he not able to do that. So he goes to Jamestown Island and sets up these tests that are going to say, well, what type of armor do we have to have? Well, at first, it's going to be uh, three layers of one inch iron plate. Well, a uh, uh, you know, eight inch Columbiad smashed to that with a, a round ball. 
So Brooke then considers what's the best way to create this. And he comes up with the idea that first we're going to back our casemates with 22 inches of live oak, white pine, and yellow pine. Those different woods give what? A certain gift. And they all are put on horizontal, vertical, horizontal. Then on top of them, that book says we have to put two layers of two inch iron plate. Well, the people at Creditor Ironworks go, what, what are we doing here? We don't, we don't have an annealing furnace that can do that. So Brooke helps them design an annealing furnace that can roll two inch iron plates in eight foot lengths. So to create this casemate, uh, to make it shot proof, we're going to have horizontal and then as you see, vertical layers to our casemate. This is very, very important because typical guns in 1861 can't pierce this casemate. Might crack some of it, uh, but they can't pierce it until improved weaponry is introduced during the Civil War. So now Brooke does this. Porter says you don't have to do all that, but uh, Brooke uh, had the ear of Mallory. Actually, at the end, you know, after the battle, uh, on 8, 9 March 1862, the Battle of Hampton Roads, you know, Porter and Brooke said, ha, look what I created. And so, you know, Porter saying I did most of the work, and Brooke says, huh, oh, my concept. So Mallory will say, well, Brooke did it, you know, and that makes Porter upset. But even more so, Brooke applies to patent the concept of iron over wood. And guess what? He's patent number 100 uh, in designing the shield of the Virginia. Now, what else he does? Oh, he does all sorts of stuff. I mean, I'll tell you the acrimony between Porter and Brooke. Tremendous. The guy who's refereeing is going to be H.P. App Roger Jones, the executive officer of the uh, Virginia, as it soon will be known. And guess what? Uh, Jones is a friend of whom? <laughs> John Murphy Brooke. And so Porter's not going to do well on this exchange. In fact, Brooke demands to have a ram. The concept of rams, you know, hadn't been around since 1571, Battle of the Panto. However, Brooke realizes I'm shot proof. I can go anywhere I want because of my screw propeller. So to save gunpowder, let's ram all the enemy ships. Uh, Porter says that's not a good thing to do, but guess what? Brooke won the day. They had three hatches, which um, Porter disagreed with. Porter wanted to have two pilot houses at each end of the casemate. They think 170 feet in length. Well, the big problem is, is that uh, Brooke investigates how they're being made. He says, no, 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 no. These things will fall apart with the first shell that hits it. And so he has the uh, pilot house redesign uh, to have a conical shape, not a rounded shape, and only one was needed. And so that's saved in energy. So let's just say this ship goes through a lot of disagreements with these two men. And uh, uh, so I think it's um, really pretty powerful. Now, if you're John Mercer Brooke and you devise an ironclad, What's the next thing you want to do? I want to invent a gun that can sink the ironclad. Why not? You know? And so this was one of uh, Stephen Russell Mallory's great dreams was to have a rifle gun. Well, we see right here uh, two Brook guns. Uh, they are uh, basically 6.4 inch guns. And uh, so, uh, you know, he will be detailed to the Department of Ordnance and Hydrography 
24 June. His job then make the armor plate uh, to supervise the overall project, but also to make these guns. So basically, if we look at a brook gun, it's made of cast iron with wrought iron bands. Those bands generally were six inch long and two inches thick. So Treader could make these bands all day long, which becomes very, very important to the survival of the gun. Now, why does he do this? Well, I have to say <coughs> that parrot guns, they're, you know, when we're inside the chamber and you have a rifled gun, you have a greater explosion producing all this energy to force the shot into the spin that is, and so he comes up with a right handed seven twist, seven lands and grooves. You put that shot in a spin that is going to be able to have a flat trajectory, have greater range. And so, look at Tredegar, uh, will decide that. Well, the best way I can do it is that I will double and triple ban my guns. So the first ones he do, does is the 6.4-inch uh, gun, uh, which uh, basically um, are equal to a 100-pounder parrot gun. And guns like this are on the... CSS uh, Virginia um, in uh, part two broadside guns. Well, Brooks says I need a more powerful um, gun, and so he develops a seven inch Brook gun. And what he does is he takes Dahlgren's, two Dahlgren's, uh, nine inch Dahlgren's, and he modifies them so that he can put it in a sleeve and rifle it so that it becomes a seven inch rifle gun. And those are in the stern and uh, uh, bow of the CSS Virginia. Now I gotta tell you, these guns are so important to the Confederacy, but because of the weakness of the Southern um, industrial world, uh, that they can only make so many. And uh, so, what is important that uh, they will build them at Tredegar Ironworks, and because of the need for these guns, they will also build them in the Selma Naval Ordnance Factory, which will be developed by KCAP Roger Jones. Now, I just want to tell you, they only make 14 6.4 inch rifles through the 1st of January, 1863. So that tells you how it's straining uh, the Confederate uh, infrastructure. Brooke realizes I gotta make my sh guns even safer so that between 1862 and 1865, they will go to the double banded and that basically they'll make 24 of these at Tredegar and 24 or 27 at Selma. And these guns are critical. Guess what guns helped to repel DuPont's fleet at the Battle of Charleston on April 7, 1863? That gun right there. Right? What all the Confederate ironclads have? Well, the Albemarle is a great example, has two of these on pivot mounts. Um, so that they may have had uh, uh, six gun ports, but they only have two guns because, you know, the weight. I mean, building an ironclad up a river means you've got to be very concerned about the weight. And this becomes very, very critical. And so, uh, uh, in essence, uh, they will put less on them because these guns weigh a lot. Let me just tell you, um, a 6.4-inch single-banded rifle 
is 9,100 pounds. A double banded rifle is 10,600 pounds. A seven inch single banded is 15,000 pounds. But the favorite will be the seven inch double banded, which weighs 15,000 pounds. But yet, Brooke wants something even more powerful. So he makes a seven inch gun that's six inches longer than all the others. And basically, it weighs 20,827 pounds. Now, while they're casting all these guns, right, there's not a lot of room for error. So basically, when they poorly cast a gun, what they're going to do is say, oh, well, we're not going to rifle it. And so we're going to keep it banded. We're going to make it into a smooth bore shell gun. Waste not, want not is the idea in the Confederacy. And so they will produce a 10-inch um, shell gun, which weighs 21,000 pounds. 11-inch shell gun, which weighs 23,000 pounds. And an 8-inch double-banded shell gun that weighs 10,370 pounds. Well, that's a pretty impressive. So, in other words, the, the, the casting of the gun does not require, um, without rifling, to have that much strength in a barrel. So you can have flaws, and the banding allows you to use it as a shell gun. Now, wait a second. I told you Brooke invented the CSS Virginia, right? The concept. Invented the casement. Invented the ram. You know, he did everything. Well, I also told you that he wanted to make sure he knew a way to sink these guns. Oh, ships. And so, Brooke is going to sit down, and he is going to create uh, what is known as the first armor piercing shot. It is called a brook bolt. It's cylindrical with oftentimes a blunt edge filled with powder. The idea is that the blunt edge can break through the armor and once it breaks through the armor, the rest of the shot will then, because it has a time fuse, will go through that hole created by the conical end, blunt, uh, almost squared, and will break through the iron, and then that rest of the explosive will come in and blow up inside a monitor's turret. Oh my gosh. You know, that is not very good for turrets. Actually, you can see damage on the USS monitor's turret. This is here at the Mariners Museum, of course. And you can see where shots screwed in to the uh, turret. And that's from the Battle of Jury's Bluff, 15 uh, May, 1862. Wow. And you know, Brooke had already invented this, this shot. Or Brooke Rolls. And yet, when they come to Hampton Roads, guess what? They say, wow. Well, we don't need those bolts. We just need explosive shells because we're going to be fighting wooden ships. Sad, sadly for the Confederates, the monitor shows up, and so they don't have the proper ammunition. But now we're starting to understand how great a scientist John Mercer Brook happens to be. I think he is uh, considered by David Dixon Porter as being one of the few men in the Confederate States Navy who showed genius during the Civil War. The only other one was H.P. Act Roger Jones. In fact, Stephen Russell Mallory, at the end of the war, will write Brooke and tell him that whatever success attended the efforts of the Confederate Navy was, in no small degree, due to skill. John Mercer Brook is indeed a brilliant mind. That, uh, so, at the end of the war, what are you going to do if you're John Mercer Brook? Well, you're going to go to Virginia Military Institute, 
Right, yeah, I see that back there. Uh, I guess you wore that just because of this. Um, and he becomes a professor of astronomy and physics, right? And he will work there from 66 uh, until his retirement uh, and uh, in the late 1890s. Uh, he actually forms a firm with Robert Dabney Minor and Catesby F. Roger Jones to sell military technology to foreign government, particularly Japan. Well, that company doesn't do well, it closes, and, but they will revitalize it in 1870 because of the Franco-Prussian War. But the Prussians said, well, we already know this stuff, <laughs> yeah, but you wrote about it. And so that company was there. But Brooke becomes a leading professor who teaches with Matthew Fontaine Maury. And when you think of those men, what did John Mercer Brooke do? Well, he created and invented a device to sound 11 miles deep the depth of the sea as well as what, the, what was down there. He also was able to chart the canyons and the peaks and valleys that exist throughout the ocean. And so that becomes a really critical aspect that allows for the construction of the first transatlantic cable. And he created a book, boat hook. And I already told you the story. He got a special award and invested it incorrectly uh, in Confederate bonds. Um, and uh, so Brooke will also, at the outbreak of the Civil War, he will be able uh, to not only initiate the concept of the Confederate ironclad design program, which every one of those 23 ironclads that go into the water are based on his concepts. Every one of them is going to have a ram. Every one of them is going to have a brook rifle which is considered the finest rifle gun of the Civil War. It did not burst. In fact, the, down in Charleston, uh, on Sullivan's Island, there was this one battery, and they had a double-banded book, 6.4 inch, and so the guy there, you know, fired it, and it burst. You know, Brook, uh, my guns don't burst. How did that happen? So he comes down to Charleston, meets with the survivors of the gun crew, Says, well, what did, what did you guys do? Oh, hell, we had double shot. Them. You, know, and, uh, you just don't do that with a rifle gun. And uh, so Brooks said, oh, not so my gun is safe. And then he created um, the concept of armor piercing shot, which we see even today in Ukraine. These sabots that are being fired are based on the concepts created by John Mitchell Brooke, scientist, FFB, and actually a brilliant teacher. John Mercer Brook is one of the key naval officers in the Confederate Navy during the Civil War. Any questions? Uh -oh. um, we'll be happy to take um, some questions from the room. We'll bounce back and forth um, between some online questions. I know y'all have all enjoyed another one of John's fantastic lectures. Any questions from the room? I'll just give the mic to you. Wow, was that the... I'll, I'll Clearly finish. you're very <laughs> thorough. <laughs> okay, okay, go ahead. Go ahead, you had to. Okay, John, um, did he get promoted from Lieutenant? Oh, yes, he did. Um, and I, I think I was thinking about science more than anything else. But yes, he was promoted to commander in 1862. Actually, he tried to convince Mallory to allow him to serve as a gunnery officer on the CSS Virginia. And Mallory says, oh, no, <laughs> you're saying up here in Richmond to invent stuff. And so that was his only disappointment uh, during the Civil War. He'll end up serving at the end of the war in Wilmington, North Carolina, uh, and then he will be paroled at Greensboro. And uh, so uh, his career then as a teacher 
is to come here and say, no, that such a mind would have been just me. Did we have another down in the front or? Okay. John, over in um, Mons Point area, Iowa County, there was a fort developed to protect the Tweed River. Mm. Brooks? Um, no, one of the forts was actually first built in 1623. So it gets modernized, but Brooke had nothing to do with it. The Fort Hugh um, is going to be designed by uh, Andrew Calcott of the um, U.S. Army uh, engineers, who was roommate with, guess whom, Robert E. Lee. So on Fort Monroe, so you go to the very house where they, they live. So yeah, um, he, I know he worked on the Jamestown Fort. And so you basically, when you have all these naval officers join the Confederacy, what you gonna do with them, right? We don't have any ships. So since they are knowledge about handling of heavy ordnance, which you have to have in coastal defense, he will uh, basically, they will actually uh, be a site like William Conway Whittle will be in charge of the Gloucester Point Um Thomas Jefferson Page will become in command of the water battery Gloucester Point and the covering war. So all that are by naval officers. In fact, Thomas Jefferson Page did a great service for the Confederacy during the Confederate retreat from the peninsula in 1860, May 3rd and 4, 1862. That's what they did. Did he uh, die during war? If he did it, what did he do after the war? He died after the war. He was a professor. He was a professor at um, uh, VMI until 18, uh, I think it's 1896. He was going to die in 1806, um, um, February 14th, 1906. Yeah, sorry, I'm kind of 19th century guy. No, he wasn't. He was in his 80s because uh, he was born on the 20th. And the, 1825. So I can't do that math very well. He's an old guy, as I hope to do. <laughs> and so, but yeah, uh, Brooke was so fabulous um, that, I mean, he, he was a great teacher. Of course, as he understood more concepts than he could actually talk about in a class session. So uh, I, 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 he's one of my great heroes. But I believe we have a question online, so we'll go ahead and take that one. Yes. Um, Eric asks, what type of things was Brooke involved with at Jamestown slash Fort Pocahontas? What are the details of how Brooke was directly involved in a test that Patsy Jones conducted at Jamestown with rifle, artillery, and iron plates? Well, that's a multifaceted question. So I'll begin with, they uh, used the naval officers to develop the gun positions, heavy gun positions. And so actually Brooke uh, will make sure all the earthworks are what slope. Remember, you know, we want to uh, cause shot to ricochet. Uh, so, and on Jamestown Island, that's where he works with Catesby F. Roger Jones to test the iron plate theories that would result in how the Confederates built their patients. You got to test those iron concepts because it would have been real easy for the Confederacy uh, to have one inch iron plate, but it did not have the shot proof ability that Brooke knew these ships had to have. I think I answered that question. Let's see it. Yeah, but it, it's great. You can go actually on Jamestown Island. They don't have a sign. You go exactly where uh, they tested the 
armor uh, and develop the concepts they use for the uh, Confederate Iron Cross. Um, let's do two more from the um, Peter asks, did Brooke consider the issues of the Marinex draft for its survivability and possible river use, or was getting the ship built the priority? Well, the big thing they decide is that the fastest way to build an ironclad, you see, as William Price Williamson would say, you know, we can't really build maritime engines. They hadn't really developed uh, those industries in the South. Why? Well, we can buy them up north and put them in ships, and so life is great. Uh, so, you know, they did, did like a book gun, by the way. Uh, and uh, you can tell by the rumble. Uh, so uh, they don't have that technology yet uh, to build these engines. And so there's the engine in the hull of the Merrimack. And so instead of taking the engine out, which would have taken time, the hull was not damaged uh, during the abandonment of Gosport Navy Yard, primarily because not only did they set it on fire, but someone pulled the seacocks. So how well does a burning ship burn when it sinks? Not well. And so they were able to raise that, keep the engine in place, rework the engine, and that made them able to build an ironclad fast, or as fast as Confederacy could. You know, they laid down five ironclads in the late summer of 1861. Of those five, the Virginia is completed and the um, Arkansas is completed. All others are either are burned at the stocks or scuttled because they just, they don't have engine problems. Maybe I should do a program on Confederate engines if you want. <laughs> no, 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 no. Actually, it's, it's, a, it's hard to believe, but the Confederates tried several different ways to produce maritime engines to drive a screw propeller. Now, you think about the Mississippi. Well, this is not on the topic, so I'll say that for another day. But they used to mostly use paddle wheels. You don't want a paddle wheel on an ironclad. What do you want? Screw propellers. Next question, please. John, can you recommend a book on Brooke? Yes, I can. It's made <laughs> by his grandson, John Richard Brooke, Jr. And it is Ironclads and Big Guns for the Confederates. And it's an excellent book. Uh, I read it and it's very readable. Um, Brooke, um, that book was also a professor at VMI. So, uh, um, so and I knew him. So, uh, and of course, I have to say that this book might be very good. <laughs> it's about the CSS Virginia and uh, um, you know, and books involvement in that project. Yeah, um, I would say you can go there and you're really going to get it. There's also a great book on um, big guns of Coastal Defense. I think it is Spencer Tucker is one of the authors, but it really goes into the technology of how they make these guns. That's why I know so much because I read the book. And so uh, it's actually excellent. Um, and Spencer Tucker will give, he has a handbook on 19th century naval warfare, which does give the credit to Brooke. But I think go to George M. Brooks book and uh, you might want to read mine. Be sure to stop by the gift shop. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we have a lot of really great books. You. <laughs> Just a question on his pedigree. Um, so in San Antonio, there's a army facility, Brook Army Medical Center. Is that that was his where father? his father died in 1851. So it's named after his father. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, he establishes a base there after the Mexican War, and uh, so because he was such an outstanding officer, 
we know little about him when it comes to the Mexican War, but he actually played a huge role in making sure that the U.S. Army continually received the supplies and the men needed uh, to wage that war. Can I sneak in too, really quickly? What was that? What was what was unique about the boat hook? And the other question I had was um, that you you mentioned that the monitor had a damage from an armor piercing shell from Julie's bluff, mm -hmm. bluff. but armor that was piercing shot, shot, also yeah, known as a bolt. But that was uh, a naval versus shore battery. Yes, but the naval shore battery had, guess what, brook guns in it, right? And so, you, I mean, I, I used to give, when we drained the turret, I used to give tours. And so every shot that dents the turret, you can tell what type of shot it is. You know, it's a nine-inch shell, you know, blah, 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 blah. Uh, but the, the brook bolt is just unbelievable how... It screws into um, the turret at 300 yards. So you can well imagine most of these battles between ironclads are fought between 50 feet, right? And so we can only speculate what a book bolt may have done um, in uh, Hamlet. Yes? Okay, we have two more questions oh online. God. Um, was Brooke ever prosecute, prosecuted by the U.S. government authorities after the war for his support of the Confederacy? No, he was not. He was paroled in Greensboro, North Carolina, and then went to Lexington. And so, um, so he was, uh, you know, um, as Abraham Lincoln said, let them down easy. And so at first, they didn't want to charge anybody. However, some of the major leaders they wanted to you know, deal with. So people like Judah Benjamin, the state for the Confederacy, he goes to Great Britain, becomes a lawyer, well, he already was a lawyer, he becomes a famous barrister there. John Taylor Wood goes to Nova Scotia because he was afraid if my grandfather was president, he might consider me a traitor, I don't know. Um, and uh, so many of them left. John Bank and Magruder went to Mexico. So, um, yes, but basically there were two cases that were really started to be prosecuted. One would be against Jefferson Davis, um, and the other was against Arden Lee. Um, they never, they never really advanced. Uh, uh, so, so no, Brooke, uh, uh, Brooke was a. Uh, because he's a scientist, I think people didn't look at him uh, quite as they should have, because being at FFV, his family were enslavers at one time or another. I, I may have found if John Luther Brook himself had any enslaved people. I know he had African American servants, as you would call them, you know. And so forth. Uh, it's just anyway. So I, I have not really done that research. I know if his grandfather definitely was uh, enslaved, but that doesn't mean Brooke. You know, as I like to say, everyone's flawed. So how do we look at Brooke? Uh, is he a? It's, does he express pro-slavery views, or does he just stick with the science? In Brooks' case, he stuck with the science. And so he was tainted, but he also uh, rides a great deal to the world that we use today. Next. How are Brooks' designs incorporated into the CSS Tennessee as improvements to the CSS Virginia format? Oh my gosh, that's a great question. <laughs> uh, because uh, once the Federals start using 15 inch guns at close range, they could really break through that pattern of armor that uh, Brooke had developed 
especially at short ranges. In fact, they break the casemate uh, at 50 yards of the CSS Atlanta. They do the same thing at about 20 feet of the CSS Tennessee. So they try to resolve that by putting more armor on it. But it was, um, the 15-inch gun was an ironclad killer. 